I would be telling you how to actually read a mood proposition and how to actually analyze it. So this is something which, uh, trust me, you would not find anywhere because this is something what I have done in my law school and this is what I have curated into certain pointers. So uh, before this, actually, uh, before going into the mood proposition, I would want you to just see a particular mood problem uh, that how a mood proposition is seen. So I would first go on to the mood proposition, which is there. I have a particular mood proposition for you guys. I found it. So I would be discussing that. See, uh, this is the mood proposition that uh, fortunately I was uh, called to judge in. So this is how a mood proposition looks like. I would first take you through the mood proposition and then we we'll move to the, uh, the PPT back. So you see uh, a mood proposition is like this. It talks about uh, certain general facts of uh, usually this, this is the starting of each and every mood proposition. It talks about the uh, Republic of India and the name is always changed because it's a fictional one. The most important part comes from actually third or fourth part, uh, fourth para, which talks about the facts. So this mood proposition talks about a 17 year old boy who went on to the internet and he came across the advertisement where he applied to the advertisement and got a job. But as he was a 17 year old and most of you are uh, aware of this particular fact that a person who is less than 18 year of old cannot get into a contract. He's not competent enough to get into a contract. So that is, is the main question of this problem. And uh, it was his father who went on to fill the form. And so this is the mood. I guess there's a bit of a network issue. One second. Yeah. I think we missed you there, sir. Yeah, sometime. Was it not audible in between? Yeah, just for a minute. Just for a minute. Okay. So, yes, I, I was saying that this is the mood proposition. It uh, lays down certain facts that are in a uh, particular important part. Then it talks further about uh, certain dates and certain relevant facts that become relevant in the uh, analysis of a case. And towards the end, sometimes uh, you will be provided with issues or sometimes are not. And you can see as the last line says, they are free to frame any ancillary issues apart from the one stated above. So this is something uh, which is there in, uh, in particular uh, uh, of a mood proposition. So I think you guys uh, saw what a mood proposition looks like. Now I will be telling you the most important part of understanding the mood problem, how to analyze it and how to decode it. Now the word that I'm using is decoding. Why I'm saying uh, that a mood problem needs to be decoded. The mood problem needs to be decoded because the mood proposition does not only contain about fictional facts. It contains about legal points. It contains a law and it contains certain facts which are relevant or which may not be relevant. So you need to first demarcate or divide the mood proposition into these aspects. So this is why I'm telling you how to decode a mood proposition, how to understand it. And if you are not able to understand it, you will not be able to perform well in your research or you will not be able to perform well in drafting a memory. Okay. So coming back to the uh, PPT that I was talking about. Yes. So this is the this is the uh, mood proposition I'll be talking about analysis of the proposition. So uh, just keep this in mind. If you're noting somewhere, note it that whenever you get a mood proposition, you have to read it at least four times. Now, why I'm saying four readings are important because of the, uh, this is the, some, this is something that I have practiced and I've excelled all. So, so the first reading, whenever you get a proposition, just give a bare reading of it. As I've written, read it like a story, just plain reading without thinking about the law. For the first reading, when you are doing, just forget that you are a law student. Read it just like an English story. 
why i'm saying this because you will get to know what the story is about and law is nothing else but a way of putting up your sto story into legal terms so when you put up a story into legal terms you must have a story there and one thing that moot proposition talks about or gives you is a well written story at first which is fictional which includes certain facts which includes drama which includes emotion so you need to just read it and the second point is very important which says a make a mental timeline of the story that is the facts don't write it anywhere don't write it on the uh, proposition itself just make a mental note of it that how it happens like for example the proposition that i uh, showed you it was a proposition which had facts like there was a contract made by the minor he went on to the website he clicked it he saw the advertisement he clicked it then his father signed and paid on his behalf and then the issue started so you see there's a mental timeline of what came first then what happened second so this is something you need to see on the first reading itself now comes the important part that is the second reading when you are reading the proposition for the second time take a pencil or a highlighter with you and highlight the facts that you think are important now what i am saying is that you think are important you need to just put this point in understanding you think are important i am saying what are not important i am not saying what are important i am saying what you think are important as per your understanding of law what you have learned till now what you think that this particular fact a or this particular fact b is important or not you just point out you just highlight it you just mark it under and just leave it there what you have to do with it i'll be telling you further then once you have highlighted or marked these facts in the moot preposition itself write it separately on a sheet of paper along with the dates and details so this will what you are doing it here that is a mental timeline you are converting that mental timeline in a proper form in after the second reading okay so this is something which you do after first and second reading and trust me once you are done with these two readings you will know what the moot proposition is about and you will be able to actually learn it by heart now comes the a little tricky part or i would say a legal part which is the reading and understanding of the proposition now comes your third reading when you are doing the third reading of the moot proposition it is also your plain reading you don't have to go into the details but very important thing is keep a pencil or a marker with you because you need to highlight certain things now during the second reading i said you have to mark the facts that you think are important now for example if this is a moot proposition itself i find story is an important fact so i'll just mark it here this way if i think law is a important part i will mark it this way now i'm just marking it now what i'll be doing it in the third part is i will be dividing it into three parts facts relevant facts or facts in issue in order to understand what relevant facts or what facts in issue are we first need to understand what facts are so these are the definition which is clearly given in the indian evidence act you are not required to learn them you are not required to use them in a moot court or for that matter trial advocacy or bail application this is just for your understanding so i will not go into the detail of explaining this i will just explain it in the form of an example so when we talk about facts this is just simple thing anything it says anything state or things which is capable of being perceived by the senses we all know we have five senses okay so anything which can be perceived by all those five senses will be considered as a fact now evidence act very nicely provides two types of facts for us one is the physical fact another one is the psychological fact physical fact is something which can be seen heard tasted or spoken all these comes under the fact of physical physical fact that is our four senses our fifth sense is the touching sense which has a mental element to it so anything which you which has a mental element to it when we talk about intention or motive that forms the psychological fact so only two types of fact are to be considered that is the physical fact or psychological fact you are not to write this particular thing in the moot preposition 
but for your understanding you can mention that this particular thing is a psychological fact this is a physical fact however it is not at all relevant what is relevant are the relevant facts and facts in issue now i would come to the relevant facts afterwards first i would talk about facts in issue now facts in issue if you understand it in a layman language it is the mudda mudda of a case it means ke jo aapke case ka main mudda kya hai aapka case kis cheez ke upar based hai wo kya fact hai which is an issue so the expression facts in issue means and include this is just a legal definition it says any fact any fact ka matlab hai psychological it can be psychological also it can be physical also which either by itself either by itself means apne aap mein or in connection with other facts in connection yani ek fact dusre fact ke sath in connected hai agar koi bhi aisa fact jo apne aap mein ya kisi aur ke sath connect ho ke kisi bhi right liability or disability this is something you need to understand this is you should not be very curious about it or very afraid about it because law when we talk about law law is nothing else but talking just about someone's right liability or disability so any particular fact which talks about right liability or disability will be a fact in issue it is as simple as that so what preposition that i showed you it talks about a 17 year old being coming into a contract so it is his disability if we talk about it's a disability because a 17 year old person is disabled from entering into a contract so this particular fact becomes facts in issue or fact in issue he actually wo cheez hai jiske pure ird gird aur pure aas paas hamara case is banta hai now comes relevant facts this is actually what we will be discussing ab hamare paas fact in issue aa gaya we know what the mudda is or what the particular issue is now we in order to prove that particular mudda or particular fact we need other things these other things what are these other things these other things are actually evidences ab evidences kya hote evidences aise hi to utke nahi aate evidences are actually relevant facts aisa koi bhi fact which is said to be relevant to another of this another thing this another is actually fact in issue or this another is actually another fact so as a koi bhi fact which is relevant by connection it would be considered as relevant facts so you need to first in the mood preposition whatever you have marked as important you need to highlight ki kaun sa fact in issue hai aur uske upar likh do ki this is fact in issue uske alawa the other facts that you think are relevant now i am not saying which are important i am saying which are relevant you mark them as rf okay so these would be your relevant facts you need to put them now this particular habit of doing mood preposition and writing relevant fact fact in issue why is it important or why is it not important is what i have written here you don't get confused it says the main issue or cause of your case is the fact in issue that i've said and all other facts which are relevant becomes the relevant facts so you need to analyze this however one thing that is very important is you need to understand this particular fact that in moot courts you don't depend or consider evidence at all so whatever we did in the third reading should not be a part of your memorial should not be a part of your arguments so you would have one question in mind then why are we wasting our time on this we are not wasting our time we are actually doing it just for this purpose if you understand a proposition from the point of view of an evidence then trust me no one not a single judge or the opposite counsel will ever be able to counter your proposition you would not be able to counter your argument and trust me you would never feel yourself in a pit and most important thing is this if you do this habit you are able to write relevant facts or facts in issue this particular thing then this would help you in a longer term when you go out from the law school and when you actually practice law so this thing is very important you need to keep that in mind it is just for the better understanding of the proposition and i again repeat it you should not depend or consider evidence at all in moot courts now i'm only saying moot courts when i say moot courts the bail application moots also go hand in hand 
However, the trial advocacy is little different. There you can actually consider evidence when you are cross-examining a person. So that is more of a procedural part that I will not be discussing because you will get confused. So understand just just understand this thing that whatever evidence is given in the preposition also, whether it's the CCTV footage or whether it's the, uh, for example, if there is a murder weapon there, you should not depend your arguments on that particular evidence. You can use them for corroborating. You can use them for particularly pointing one thing, but you should not base your full arguments on that. For example, I've seen certain people in my law school also. And when I was judging, they said that a particular uh, murder weapon was uh, found, which was a knife. This person came and said that just because there is a blood on the knife, then it is a murder weapon. Okay, that is given in the proposition. Then he went on to say that murder weapon was found near the vicinity of accused house. So that is why there is a possibility that accused may have thrown that particular murder weapon. Okay. Now, what I'm trying to say is you can use this thing, but just keep in mind that if that particular evidence was not there in the proposition, what would you have done? So that is the thing. The court in a moot court or the judge would not only rely on that murder weapon because to be honest, what you're doing in a moot court is actually your articulation, your arguments, which you'll be getting marks for. You will not be getting marks for what is already written in the proposition. So that is why I'm saying that if you have these, these kinds of things, use them, use them freely, but don't depend or consider them. Okay. So with this, we're done with th third reading. Now comes your final reading. When you are reading the final part, like when you are reading for the fourth time, try to analyze the law points. See, when you're discussing the first three re readings, I was not talking about any law points with you. In the fourth reading, when you are completely aware of the facts, the fact and issue, then come to the law points. Clearly in the proposition, the sections would be mentioned or the act name would be mentioned. If that is there, clearly mark, mark that thing. That this particular is, for example, 302 or this particular is section 13 of Hindu Marriage Act. Just mention that. If it is not written, then you need to just brainstorm a little. This is not a researching point of thing. Just brainstorm. And then your work is not done. If you have only written it, you need to read the law that is applicable to the problem. So you need to read the law from the where act. Don't go into the books. So you have exam number ka question. Sirf or sirf where act say you need to read the law. Or when, when you are reading it, it's very important that you pick out the essentials of it. So where acts me likhe hote na essentials wohi essential hote. So with this we are done with the understanding of the mood proposition. Now comes a very important part that is the decoding. Now what I am saying about decoding, decoding can only be done if you have completely understood the problem. So if you have not understood the problem after four readings, don't worry. Go on, read it for five times. Read it for six times or read it for 10 times. There's no issue at all, but minimum you need to read it for four times. Then these things are uh, actually practical, which I'll be showing you once I'll be reading the mood preposition. It is read between the lines and read from one full stop to the next. Don't read the full proposition at one go. Write the important points in the problem itself, which I've been telling you in all the types of reading. Then this is a must thing that you need to do. Analyze which point is relevant to plaintiff and which is to respondent because you need to prepare memorials and you need to prepare from both the sides. So the proposition is mixed with facts that is tilted towards plaintiff or respondent and you need to find them out, find them out and write it. Okay. So now I'll be going to the, I'll be going to the mood proposition and be just briefly discussing the procedural parts that I just mentioned, how to decode it. It's very easy. There's not much of it because this is something which I want you to practice. Okay. So this is not something which I'll be teaching you throughout. This is something that you have to practice on your own. So I'll be sharing a particular, uh, I'll be sharing, uh, this memorial, this problem with you also, and you need to 
decode it yourself. So I'll just give a brief decoding that you need, how you need to read. So see, as I said, two things, read between the lines and read from first full stop to the other. So the first line is the Republic of Indiana became independent on August 15, 1947, full stop. Now understand this particular line. If you need to understand and decode, it does not say much. It just say that Republic of Indiana is actually India. That's it. Don't go into detail because it's not necessary. The next line, it is a region of rich flora and fauna. It's society is perfect, blend, blah, blah. This is just wastage. Don't go into it. What is important is India is a progressive and secular nation and believes in peaceful cooperation with its neighbors. Not relevant for us. It is just put up to confuse us or to just use it. You, you should not use anything from Para 1 at all. Now, this is something which is important because it says that the Constitution of Republic of Indiana has a legislative powers enumerated in 7th schedule of the Constitution, which means that the Constitution of Indiana is something which is similar to Constitution of India. That's it. Not relevant. We should not consider. This is very important. Mr. Sook, a 17-year-old boy. So first thing would be a 17-year-old boy. This becomes your relevant fact. Just write relevant fact there. Lives in city X, Indiana. Not important. Full stop. He's extraordinarily, extraordinarily versed in the field of computer science and is keen about learning and creating new things. Now this line becomes, you'll think that this line is not important at all. But this would rip, this would become important from the point of respondent. Now, how it would be uh, for from the point of respondent? Because it says that he's keen about learning and creating new things, and he's extraordinarily versed in the field of computer science. That means he is intelligent enough. Although he's a 17-year-old boy, but he has good knowledge. He has good brain. He is well versed with computer science and he's keen about learning and creating new things. So respondent can take this particular line and mold it in the sense that it is the fault of Mr. Sukhun. Because he is so brainy, he's so knowledgeable that what he did, he was acting as a mature person. Although he was immature, this is something which is there given legally. So this becomes a relevant fact. But this particular line, which I'm talking about, this becomes a relevant fact from the point of view of a respondent. Then on one fine day while surfing the internet, he stumbles across an advertisement for freelance app development from by this particular company. This is also again your relevant fact for both plaintiff and respondent. Now, the advertisement specifically made a mention to the company's no contract with minors policy. This is a very important part which becomes a relevant fact from the point of view of again respondent because the company is not at fault respondent is what respondent would be saying what that the company is not at fault and it is the fault of only mr sook so as they said that they have clearly mentioned that there's a no contract with minus policy so this is how you need to read between the lines now this particular part read with this particular thing if we club both of them, we are actually making a strong case by the respondent. Just coupled, uh, couple them with the two or three cases here and there and you got yourself a one good issue. So this is something which is what uh, reading between the lines means or reading from one full stop to the other means. This current episode, the full length, will be available on YouTube. And also you will be able to find that latest updates about the session as well on Instagram and other platforms as well. So do like, share and subscribe to our channel on YouTube and also follow our Instagram page with regard to regular updates as well.